All right, y'all, I'm going to start here in a minute or two. Um, if you're not muted, just go ahead and mute yourself. And for anyone who joined us a little, or I guess right on time, we're going to give everyone just another minute or two to join us. And then we'll go ahead and kick it off. So thanks for your patience and thanks for joining us today. We'll kick it off here in just a minute or two. All right, I think in the interest of time, we can go ahead and get started. So thank you to everyone who is joining us on the line today. Welcome to the Global Power System Transformation Consortium's webinar on workforce development, the workforce development pillar of the GPST. So thanks again for joining and um, we can go ahead to the next slide. So before we get started, I just want to cover a couple housekeeping and WebEx tips just to ensure we can do what we can to have a, you know, a, a, an event free of technical issues. Um, I'm sure we're all used to by now all of the virtual events in the COVID era, but um, some things that, you know, we can do just to ensure success. Um, I think you should be automatically muted and automatically have your camera off as an attendee. Um, but, you know, if you want to interact, if you have any questions, please type them in at the Q&A box. It is at the bottom right-hand side of the WebEx application. You'll see there with the little red box around it, you'll see a participants um, box, a chat box, and then those three dots will bring up Q&A. Um, I encourage you to ask your questions in Q&A, and if you have comments, drop them in chat. Um, I'll, of course, be monitoring both for questions, but um, please try and actually direct your comments into the Q&A so we can manage them there. Um, for both Q&A and chat, please do ensure that you are um, sending it to all panelists. You'll see that the to um, or the ask both have a drop down. Um, if you send it to host, it's only going to come to me. So please be sure to send it to all panelists so that everyone we have on the line can see your questions as they come in. We will have our moderated Q&A session um, at the end of the, of the uh, presentation. Um, also, just a couple other tips. If you would like to change your layout, you can see that there is a layout button where you can um, select grid to show all videos, stage to show the speaker, um, or focus to only show um, the speaker alone. Um, and for audio issues, I recommend um, checking your audio inputs and outputs. Make sure you don't have it, you know, sending to a Bluetooth anywhere. That can certainly happen. Um, if you are having issues with your audio um, and you're listening by computer, try dialing in by phone. There are global dial-in numbers on the invitation, or at least there should be. Um, also, next to your mute button, there is a switch audio option. You can also use that to have it call you. Um, if you are in the US and if you're listening by phone and you're having issues with that, you can always try swapping over to computer. So basically, if you're having audio issues, try um, using the alternative audio that, that uh, you aren't currently using. So um, with that, we can go ahead to the next slide. So for our agenda today, um, obviously we're in the middle of the introduction and housekeeping. Um, here in a minute, uh, we'll have an overview of the GPST and what we do, and then we'll dive into the meat of our presentation content. content. We're going to cover the value of workforce development, um, and you can see all of our speakers here in that um, center column who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, we will then also have a overview of all Pillar X3 activities, 
Um, our experts on the line today will also do an overview of the teaching agenda, um, as well as other aspects of it. And then, as I mentioned, we will conclude with a question and answer session. With that, we can go to our speaker slide. So um, today with us, uh, as I mentioned, my name is Isabel McCann. I am the communications lead for the GPST. Um, I work at NREL here in Colorado. Uh, we also have Sadie Cox, um, who is another uh, NRELian, and she is the director of the GPST Interim Secretariat. We have Balarco Shudri, who um, is from Imperial College London, and he is one of our Pillar 3 leads. Um, we have Julia Madavoison, um, lead planning engineer from ERCOT, uh, Vijay Vital, a regents professor from Arizona State University, and Tim Green, who is also a part of Imperial College London and um, another one of our Pillar 3 leads. And then we have Mark O'Malley from ESIG, who is um, one of our Pillar 3 or Pillar 1 leads. So um, a great group online today. And um, with that, I will pass it over to Sadie, who will give us an overview of the GPST. So thanks again, everyone. Great, thanks so much, Isabel, and thanks so much to everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, so I'll just start with a very high level overview of the GPST before we dive into the main content of the webinar today, which is focused on our Pillar 3 workforce development activities. So the GPST is a new initiative that we recently established together with many partners around the world with a really targeted focus on support and collaboration with system operators to research and implement cutting edge and proven operational and engineering solutions required to bring very high levels of renewable energy and complementary technologies onto the grid. So to really set um, the research vision of the GPST, we're working with our group of founding system operators at the CEO level, and this includes system operators in Australia, the UK, Ireland, Denmark, um, and the United States. And so these um, FSOs, or founding system operators, together with our technical institute partners are championing research activities of the consortium, and they've been defining a set of common research priorities, which can then inform really critical um, research and development investments at the national level. Um, and the research agenda, um, which brings together all of that information under our Pillar 1 activities, is expected to be released later this week or, um, or very soon, which is very exciting. Um, so in addition to the SFSOs, we also have a core team of world leading technical institutions, which you can see on this slide, kind of in the left hand side um, of the, the pyramid. Um, and this is institutions from all around the world that have come together to really set the direction of the consortium and to lead on specific topical pillars and regional activities. And then in addition to the core team and FSOs, we're also partnering with up to 14 emerging economy and developing country system operators. Um, in the coming year to support them in advancing power system transformation, and many of them will also be serving as leaders for peer learning in particular regions of the world. And we have official partners listed here, which include system operators in India, Indonesia, Vietnam, South Africa, and Peru, um, and we're actively forming partnerships with several others, as I mentioned. So with this group of partners, um, we're supporting system operators through our five action pillars. So pillar one is coordinated by ESIG or the Energy Systems Integration Group, and that's where we're bringing together our founding system operators to develop that high level research agenda that I mentioned before. Um, pillar two is where the core team and FSOs are working with our partner system operators in developing countries and emerging economies to provide deep technical support through fellowships and targeted technical assistance on advanced operational and engineering solutions, as well as broader peer learning at the regional and global level. Um, pillar three, which is our uh, focus for our webinar today, is coordinated by Imperial College in London and is focused on improving and applying cutting edge educational materials and courses at the university level and upskilling the current system operator workforce with continuing education. Uh, pillar four is coordinated by IEEE and is focused on supporting countries on technology standards, certification, and testing to enable higher levels of renewables on the grid and really localizing technologies to very unique contexts. And then finally, pillar five is coordinated by VTT in Finland and is focused on improving and disseminating best in class open tools and data to support system operators with various types of key analyses to enable grid integration and providing technical assistance to developing country system operators to apply those tools in more specific contexts. So that's kind of the high level overview of the GPST um, just to open up the webinar today. And I'm very glad to answer any questions during the Q&A portion um, of the webinar at the end. Um, so on the next slide, 
We'd also like to invite everyone to continue to engage with the GPST. Um, the webinar today is part of a broader series, um, and we'll be having one to two webinars um, every month going forward. So next month, our webinar will be focused on Pillar 4 um, and uh, on the impact of an IP um, inverter-based generation on bulk power system dynamics and short circuit performance. Um, we also will be sending out information soon on a very high level launch event um, for the GPST on the sidelines of President Biden's uh, leader summit on climate. So keep an eye out for that. We'll send it out to our distribution list. Um, we're also really happy to have you all um, join our network if you haven't already and you'll receive information on the webinars. Um, you'll receive our newsletter. Um, and on our website, you can also sign up to stay involved with various um, various elements of the GPST through uh, the different pillars or through um, some of our regional work as well. And then we're also really glad to have folks reach out if they're interested um, in light touch technical assistance opportunities as well, and we can explore that further. Um, and yeah, and also just reach out if you have other questions or feedback. So I'll stop there and let folks dive in on the, the main content for the webinar today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sadie. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Julia. All right. Um, so I just wanted to give in a short introduction as to why workforce development. Uh, am I speaking out of turn? <laughs> nope. Perfect. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so why workforce development? So as you all probably know, the electric industry is undergoing tremendous change. There's a rapid transformation of uh, generation mix towards higher shares of inverter based resources such as wind and solar, connecting both to transmission and distribution networks. Uh, characteristics of electric demand is changing with growth of electric vehicles and electric heating. Uh, these are creating new infrastructures and uh, significant electric demand, as well as new pat patterns of electricity consumption uh, and also creating new flexibilities. On the other hand, electricity markets are undergoing significant changes and all of a sudden uh, electrical engineers are having to understand how markets work and uh, market experts are trying to navigate new waters, understanding power system operation. Along with that, and perhaps most noticeably, there is a change uh, in rapid development in communications and information technologies uh, into affordability of computational power communications and cloud technologies open new opportunities for power system operation and analysis. So what does it all mean to um, workforce um, that has to support all this transformation? Um, so present future engineers working in electric energy sectors are having to develop new skills um, and areas of expertise. And I'll name just few from my system operators uh, perspective. We need better understanding of uh, emerging technologies. And when I'm saying emerging technologies, I don't only mean generation technologies. There are also new network devices uh, that are popping up, and we need to understand how they work. Uh, engineers need to develop familiarity with uh, new sophisticated study methods and tools such as electromagnetic transient uh, simulations, real time dynamic simulations, hardware and loop simulations, just to name a few. And these tools are increasingly being used alongside more traditional phasor domain simulation tools uh, to model large portions of the grid or sometimes entire grids uh, with high share of inverter based resources. There is a need of understanding of controls on, of inverter based resources and ability to uh, tune some uh, control parameters uh, to allow more transmission from areas with uh, high penetration of inverter based resources. Uh, we need to understand how system protection is impacted by change in generation mix. Uh, we increasingly see need for engineers to be able to write code, uh, query large data sets, uh, perform analysis uh, of this big data uh, using statistical computing and analytics tools. Um, engineers also need to develop uh, predictive models using uh, machine learning methods. There is increasing need for development of custom tools for control rooms um, for system operators, as well as offline analysis and reporting tools in-house. Uh, the boundary between planning and operations time horizons is becoming more blurred um, because it makes uh, it takes as, uh, as little time as 18 months to develop a new inverter-based resource compared to what it previously took uh, three to five years to develop a new uh, thermal generator. 
uh, operations practices are getting more sophisticated and increasingly operations constraints need to find its way into planning studies. Um, you know, we feel like planning methods are lagging behind. There is growing need for engineers uh, to understand energy market design and effect it has on system planning and operations, carrying out power system studies without understanding how operational constraints may impact market and how market requirements and constraints may impact operating conditions uh, is not realistic anymore. So all of the above points is not only calling for upskilling of existing workforce, uh, system operators around the world, uh, including founding system operators of GPST, admit scarcity of specialists. Uh, there are maybe one, two people skillful in some of the areas that I talked about. Uh, and these people cannot be easily replaced. And as we talk about involvement in GPST, we also find it difficult to loan those people's time uh, to these activities. So there is a gap uh, that cannot be covered simply by upskilling existing workforce, and we need to be, this gap needs to be filled with uh, new recruitment of fresh university graduates with suitable skills uh, and new know-how. So I hope that GPST will help us uh, and other system operators to fill these gaps uh, through upskilling current workforce as well as preparing new graduates uh, for shifting realities of the uh, electric energy sector. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Julia, for outlining the importance and uh, need for workforce development and also. Uh, highlighting some of the gaps in expertise that uh, need to be plucked uh, very soon. Um, and this is precisely where pillar three of GPST uh, kicks in. Um, so as Julia mentioned, I mean, and most of us on this call know that power systems are evolving quite rapidly. And some of the ongoing research items would have to be ready for adoption very soon and hence uh, forms topics where training and teaching is needed. So we have come up with uh, a list of such topics which aren't uh, typically covered in the university curriculum or for that matter isn't part of a typical training program within the system operators. And we uh, aim to develop the teaching and training material on those. Um, this would target uh, both ends. So on the one hand, the material would be for upskilling of the existing system operators workforce. Um, and also uh, this will be used for in the postgraduate power engineering program uh, within universities. And a key component of this uh, workforce development within GPS is to promote inclusiveness and diversity, especially gender diversity. And my colleague Tim Green would uh, elaborate on this towards the end of the webinar. Um, so the approach we are taking in pillar three is uh, we plan to develop this teaching and training material on so-called forward-looking topics uh, in the sense that, as I said, these most of these topics are not generally part of the university curriculum right now or uh, part of the training program. So that's why we are saying forward looking. And also these are taken straight out of some of the research items, either ongoing research or recent research. And we want to work up, uh, work up the material based on those research outcome, which could then be uh, rolled out as teaching and training uh, material. Uh, of course, we would leverage any existing open source material that are aligned with these forward looking topics that have been identified. And also, if there are some open source material that could act as background reading for students or professionals who are not up to speed to uh, 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 learn from these forward looking topics, we would we are very open about using those material and your inputs on this would be very helpful. Um, we did a survey uh, on some of the postgraduate power programs in universities across the world and looked at the training programs. And we saw that they vary quite a lot in terms of the structure and the content. And obviously, 
we are not going to overhaul those. Instead, what we would do is develop this uh, as a menu of uh, bite size uh, topics. Just to give an example, I mean, each of these topics would have three to six hours of lecture material uh, supported by some supplementary exercise. And the idea is that if we prepare the material like this, uh, this can be then integrated in a customized way into an existing curriculum or uh, existing training program, uh, depending on the gaps and the local priorities uh, of the region. Now, back in August, September time, uh, period last year, um, we assembled a group of academics from six universities that you see on the right. Uh, and we initiated a consultation process uh, to identify such forward looking topics. And eventually we uh, came up with about 100 such topics, which uh, you can see in the document that we have released. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And these topics are uh, organized under nine broad areas. And this is going to be now uh, made public for wider consultation and your feedback on this is uh, welcome. Um, apart from the, the topic areas, we have a, a, a introductory piece to set the scene and also uh, have some motivational material to promote interest in joining power education or upskilling in the first place. And also, as I said, to promote uh, gender diversity in particular. And again, uh, my co-panelists would be um, elaborating on some of these later on in the webinar. Now, bulk of our effort in Pillar 3 would be in developing these material, but um, uh, in terms of dissemination globally, we would work with our university partners in different countries and regions. Some of uh, whom we have already identified, and we are obviously going to expand this. So if you are interested in joining this effort, uh, please do let us know. Uh, this is the inaugural teaching agenda document that we have posted on the GPST website. You can see the link uh, uh, here at the bottom. So you can access this document. You can see what's in there in terms of those uh, forward looking topics, uh, the context setting. And on the right, what you see are the nine subject areas under which those topics are organized. And the ones that are highlighted with a red box around them are the ones that my co-panelists will be taking a deeper dive uh, later in this webinar. So I'm not... Uh, spending much time on this, except to say that this document is now available on the GPS2 website. We'd encourage you to go and have a look and uh, give us your feedback, your comments. I mean, this is by no means set in stone. We expect this to evolve as we have a uh, wider consultation uh, with various stakeholders. Uh, apart from outlining the topic, so this is about a 50 page document, so it outlines the topics, it's got a bit of preamble, and what it also contains are about 20 exemplar topic descriptors. So you'll see, I mean, this is just one example that you see on the right. So this is uh, telling a bit more about some, uh, uh, some of the chosen topics. Here is the one uh, under the area of planning on emergent essential services. But the idea here is that these are meant to give a flavor of uh, what we intend to develop in terms of material in due course. So this is like a typical uh, uh, module descriptor that you would see in an university uh, course. So it, it, would contains, uh, it would contain the context, a summary of the content of that topic, uh, prior learning, if that's required, the learning outcomes, target audience, etc., right through to the assessment. So there are a bunch of about 20 of these included in that document. We don't have this topic descriptors for each and every topic, but uh, we hope that the ones that are there would give you a flavor of the coverage we want to give. 
So that was a heads up on this teaching agenda. As I said, my colleagues are going to uh, take a deeper dive and at this point, I would hand over to Mark. Mark, I think you might be muted. if we can hear him in just a second. Can you hear me now? Again, Mark? No. Yes, great. <laughs> yep. yeah, the, uh, it, for some reason, the, the phone didn't actually work. But anyway, I'm back on the computer. So, so thanks, Falarco. So just to say uh, one thing, you know, when we say we're going to take a deep dive into this, it's it's two or three slides on a topic that's that's vast. So I don't think we're going to take a deep dive, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, I live in, in uh, GPST, which is the research pillar. And again, you know, teaching and research go go hand in hand. So I think that's that's an important thing to say. Also, the pillar one re research agenda is also up online at the moment. So if you want to look at that. So context setting, one of the major things we're going to try to set up for courses is to, you know, um, set the context of what's going on and to encourage people to do it. I, do, I don't think it's a, a terribly difficult thing to set the context. Most people are aware of what's going on in the world. Difficult thing to encourage people to do it, but um, so, you know, the scene setting, obviously, sorry, can you go back? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of this has been said before by Julia and Balarco, et cetera, you know, the energy electricity circuit and decarbonization is Yes, there's national trends and people buying lots of renewable energy. There's also a trend in you know other infrastructures, you know, ICT, gas and transport interacting with electricity system, you know, transport, electric vehicles, etc. There's some major well, there are a lot of challenges with, with variable renewable energy and inverted base resources. We said that they're, they're not over, they're not insurmountable. There, there's a lot of research to be done, but you know, once the research is done and they're deployed, we need to get it into the education system. And then very importantly, you know, we, we have to have this, you know, we, we need to give access to energy to the entire world. It's, it's no point in just having it for the developed world. So it's an important aspect of it too. Um, so it's changing. Uh, it's all changing. We've said it before, professionals need to expand and adapt their knowledge base. That's for sure. Um, the energy system itself is made up of many parts and many subsystems. So, you know, to understand the overall system, you have to understand the various parts. And that's how the when you structure it into these hundred different topics or whatever, they're all subsystems or, you know, you know, parts of a bigger system. But to understand the system, you really have to understand the individual parts. I mean, for motivational, you know, I think careers in energy. I mean, if this is global, you know, the entire world's energy system is changing. So from a global perspective, it's you know, involves all of society. Gender and diversity are very important. So you know, this is not some sort of career choice in one part of the world. It's everywhere. It's obviously different in different parts of the world. You know, it's robust, you know, from a career point of view, I don't think this area is going to change in terms of demand for people for at least, I don't know, 50, certainly my lifetime and most of the people in this call's lifetime. I think it's also important to point, you know, it's meaningful, interesting and challenging. I mean, this is a challenging area. You're doing something good for society, et cetera. So I, I think that's all very important. I've put in myself, um, a little graphic there, greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. So the National Academy, the US said that the electricity, electricity was the greatest achievement of the 20th century. My own personal opinion is the greatest achievement of the 21st century will also be the electricity system, but I won't be around to see that. But I, I think it's an interesting area to be in. Next slide, please. So just as you know, one simple example of many thousands that we could give a nice colorful graphic here. Um, this is uh, the SNSP limit uh, that AirGrid used, the Irish system operator, 
system non-synchronous penetration limit. And this is a limit, uh, a limit that through research we're pushing up. So the limit when this graph was drawn was 50%. So basically it said that you could only, you, on the Irish power system, you could only have 50% of the generation, but non-synchronous essentially. The ratio is a little bit different than that. It's wind plus imports over demand plus exports, but effectively 50%. Uh, and if you didn't limit it to that and there was a fault in the system, the system may not recover. Uh, just to indicate that the research agenda that we're working on is working on pushing the 50, but AirGrid are already at 70%. I suppose in many ways, the research agenda that we're working on is to bring the 75% there right up to 100%. That's what the research agenda is about. But I, I show this simply to show, you know, this wasn't a constraint from a planning or an operational point of view uh, five years ago, but 10 years ago, it certainly wasn't either. So things like this are new. So this is just an articulation of, of things that are new that we have to deal with. Next slide, please. I think Julia did a very good introduction to planning and operations. I mean, Julia made a very important point. They, they're becoming much more linked. So I'm gonna talk about planning and operations. In many ways, we were actually considering putting both of these topics together because they are so, you know, they're becoming much more connected to each other because what's happening. But we left them into two parts and many of the topics in one part, you know, could be merged into the other part. So planning paradigm needs to change. I'm going to be repetitive here with many things I've said already. You know, very renewable energy, batteries all have different characteristics. Demand patterns are changing, particularly if you electrify transport and heat integration with other infrastructures, extreme events. I mean, I think climate change itself is having an effect on extreme events. So we have to account for them, more active consumers. And I think the most important thing is the last sub bullet. They're all changing together. This is not a case that one of these things is happening. This is a case that all of these things are happening in parallel. And I think that's what makes this transformation so interesting, challenging, difficult, etc. In in the past, you know, there has been there have been changes in the power system before, but generally it was only one or two of these things were or one or two things were changing, but not 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 this many. Um, I think Julia said it very well. Stronger into dependency in planning and operations. Just some example topics. There 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 you know there's there's all sorts of example topics in Britain. You know, multi time horizon probabilistic forecasting, robust planning with respect to network design. I mean, how do you design a network that is suitable for all future, so to speak, when you don't have control over where the generation would be. The planning portfolio, the planning scale has become bigger. You're not just planning, you know, interconnection is a very good way of integrating lots of renewables. So if you have more interconnection, you really have to sort of have some sort of plan for the bigger system. If you're integrating with transport and heat, the the, the sort of the, the canvas you're working, it just gets bigger. So you don't have to deal with bigger systems because you, you know, if they're interacting more, you can't plan one without regard to the other. The objective planning, you know, you're going to have to, the objectives are not just purely economic, although wind and solar now are very cheap. You know, there's also policy drivers, et cetera. So there's, you know, you have to keep in account. It's not just purely on cost. There's other things that, that matter as well. Regional diversity, I've put that in there. I think it's very important. You know, in certain regions, there's certain policies that apply and certain policies that don't, et cetera. And I think that's very important to understand. And then planning with the active consumer. I mean, how how do you plan with a consumer is going to become more active? It's very difficult. Next slide. So I'll just quickly, I mean, the, like I said, the operations part is very similar to the planning part. I suppose the difference is, is that, you know, in this case, I mean, it's like planning. It's going to be impacted by a lot of these things. Compared to planning, the other timescales are shorter. You know, it's sort of on a daily basis and you're not including investment. Other than that, they're pretty much the same. Uh, you know, so you want to schedule supply and part of demand. I mean, before it was just supply, you now it's you can schedule some of the demand, which is different. Uh, you know, and it's all going to be done through energy services uh, of some description. I think it's important to point out that a lot of the so called ancillary services or services that we're talking about today are going to be replaced or, you know, uh, replaced or adapters because the services that we require in this new paradigm are going to be different. And again, on the right, there's some examples. I won't. I won't uh, go into those in too much detail. Uh, okay, that's me finished. I'll pass over to my colleague, BJ. BJ. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So some of the topics uh, that uh, we are um, 
examining in greater detail the, one of the first topics is this uh, stability and protection. So the question is how does a high fraction of uh, inverter based resources impact stability? Because you know the some key issues to look at uh, lack of uh, in inherent inertial response, uh, limited short circuit current contributions, and dynamics uh, con governed by the control loop of choices. So these are some things we are looking at a number of topics in that particular area and then um, uh, be looking also at uh, alternate protection strategies and uh, how to examine the fault response of uh, inverter based resources. So these are some uh, essential topics as far as stability and protection goes. And this is kind of aided by what is there on the next slide. Uh, which uh, is a, a, a classification of uh, stability with uh, high penetration of inverter based resources. This came out of a IEEE Power and Energy Society Power System Dynamic Performance Committee report. It's called the number is TR77. And what you see on the left hand side is all um, new phenomena uh, which are kind of introduced because of uh, high penetration of inverter based resources. And as you see from this slide, they require a different uh, degree of modeling detail, different tools for analysis and examination of fast transients, uh, which was typically not done when we had a system dominated by synchronous machines. We primarily did phasor domain uh, modeling and analysis, and that served us very well for all these years. But now when we are looking at this uh, control interaction, the impact of very fast acting power electronic switching on the system. All of this makes uh, uh, the need for um, uh, electromagnetic uh, transient analysis and modeling more critical. Uh, next slide, please. And then there is this issue of uh, restoration uh, with the high penetration of renewables. How would black start be provided? Uh, should our strategies be changed? What are the interdependencies between electricity and other infrastructures? Natural gas may play a very important role in order to support the system. How do you then coordinate wind and solar with uh, without storage? So these are some uh, key issues and some of the topics that we have identified are shown in this blue block on the right hand side. But that's just a sample of some of the things that we have uh, been examining and think that is uh, important. Uh, next slide, please. And then comes, uh, you know, the fact that we have so much uh, asynchronous generation, HVDC transmission would play a very key role. Um, uh, what are the issues uh, with uh, increasing uh, interconnections with via HVDC? The role of VSC HVDC links, and then uh, what are, would be the new innovations and some of the topics that we have chosen on in this particular topic is uh, uh, listed on, again on this blue block. So those are some of the things that we are examining, and then this is uh, most of the topics that I have addressed uh, relate to the bulk electric system, and then we do realize that uh, the distribution system also will play a big role with the DERs coming in there and my colleague uh, Tim Green will address that particular topic. Thank you Vijay for that uh, very slick handover. Um, so indeed, uh, a lot is changing in distribution networks. The, the growth of distributed energy resources, both small scale generation and storage, the electric vehicle charging and, and very importantly, the uh, the growth of demand side actions. Um, and you see that a bit in the in the diagram on the right hand side. But the other thing you might note in that diagram on the right hand side is is the increasing interest in using power electronic devices to bring flexibility. So perhaps putting back to back converters across open points or converters at feeder ends and connecting them via DC links to give additional and controlled routing options for power and for voltage control. And the pictures down the bottom are an example from a trial by UK Power Network of, of some back-to-back -back converters in a substation environment. I, I had a meeting earlier today with some of the engineers involved in those trials, and I don't think they'll mind me saying that actually for them, 
they have to go off and do a great deal of learning about the characteristics of paratonics before they as network engineers can design the safety case, uh, the substation environment and the protection systems for this equipment. So this really is a topic where a fresh wave of educational power network engineers needs to happen. On top of all of that, um, the vast number of these small actors now within distribution systems gives us a, a, a much different data acquisition challenge, um, a data analysis challenge, a need to provide information to control room engineers in a, in a, in a digestible format, so good situational awareness, and good optimization tools that, that cope with the scale of the data problem. Uh, we often hear the term microgrids and, and increasingly multi-energy microgrids, and sometimes it's also called a local energy system. So this is a recognition that in some areas, there's somebody else other than a network operator managing and operating a section for some local objective, perhaps to maximize self-consumption of, of, of solar energy, for instance. But now an, a network operator has to be aware of what's going on in a part of the network where someone else has control. And that's mirrored somewhat by the relationship between distribution networks and transmission networks. We're already moving from just network operations to using third party assets to deliver services, so distribution system operators, but an exchange of services across the boundary with the TSO and a blurring of that boundary. Can I have the next slide, please? So on the next slide, that's, that's illustrated. This is a, a request for service and an and acknowledgement and delivery of service across traditional boundaries between operators. Um, happening a bit in voltage, but maybe other services. So on the right hand side, you see some of the individual topics and in the document, in the teaching agenda, two of those, one on paratronics and one on high penetration of DER are spelled out in some detail. Next slide. I'm going to skip through three further areas to bring us up to the total nine. So power systems with integrated infrastructure. I think we're well aware that further sectors of the economy will be electrified in order to decarbonize transport and heating and cooling. In the UK example, having had a decade of reduction in demand through energy efficiency, we're now expecting demand to double over the next two decades. But also that brings with it a huge amount of additional complexity with the interactions with, with all these other sectors of the economy and, a, and a, a new view of what it means to operate critical infrastructure because of the emergence of common cause um, failure modes across different infrastructures. And of course, um, an energy system relies very heavily on its data acquisition and it's the digitalization of the control infrastructure. Um, and as we do that, of course, we're also recognizing that advances in digital technologies are causing societal and behavioral changes that change the way we use energy. And we also have to recognize that the emergence of this reliance on digital raises a whole set of issues around the cyber threats to cyber physical systems and the responses. Next, please. Um, there are a whole set of new analysis techniques that, are, that the next generation of power systems engineers have to be on top of. The means to analyze the stability, as Vijay was saying, of systems involving inverters. Some of the traditional techniques are just not fit for that purpose. Um, the rise of stochastic um, behaviors within our systems from, from weather resources or demand um, changes and so forth, and the ways to analyze those. We have to address the curse of dimensionality, which is about the very large volume of data being generated and how you analyze and optimize around that. And the need also to acquire that data, perhaps in new ways, and much higher bandwidths. Next, please. Although the GPST consortium as a whole, with, with system operators at its core, is not in the first instance at least pursuing markets and investment as a research topic, we have to recognize that that's the environment in which our system operates. And it's being challenged by the growth of variable renewables in terms of the way the energy capacity and services markets might evolve. And we have to recognize, as Mark was saying, that Although there are some common features in market design, there are regional and, and country differences in, in, the, in, in the economic and political systems and, and then in the natural resources available. So you see again on the right hand side, a whole series of topics 
that we think as our first cut at least need to be covered within that. Next slide. So those are the nine areas. It has been rather a gallop through them, but you have in the chat window the link to the teaching agenda. And as Balako was saying, it's not a finished document. We, we are issuing it in, as a consultation in order to, to generate feedback. But let me move on and, and touch on a few other issues, because as well as trying to develop a coherent set of new topic areas for, for future power systems engineers, we also need to think about how uh, we're going to deliver it. And the first stage of thinking about that might be, well, what can we leverage as existing resources? So some of you might well be aware of the uh, the resource centre run by IEEE Power and Energy Society. There's lots of good material there. University of Minnesota hosts this consortium of universities for sustainable power. Many good resources. There are several MOOCs available on a wide range of topics, both engineering and economics and, 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 and behavioural issues around energy systems. And you may well know of other online resources that, that we haven't listed here and are not in the document. So we're very keen, obviously, I think it would be foolish otherwise, to, to leverage those resources to not to duplicate or to use some of these resources perhaps to provide a wider context for the uh, slightly narrower power systems education piece that, that we're seeking to define. Next slide. We also have to think about the logistics of delivering this. Now, this is an area where we're yet to kind of um, flesh out all of our ideas and we welcome input from, from all of you that are listening. Um, we have in our mind a delivery method which is sometimes characterised by the flipped classroom. So instead of lecturers standing at the front of class and lecturing and delivering material, the material is online as video presentations and, and as written documents of various sorts. And then the in-classroom or in-person time is spent helping students or, uh, and others embed and understand that material through, through exercises, projects and quizzes. So as well as developing the topic areas in terms of lecture material, we need to develop these ex classroom based exercises that others may pick up and adapt. Many universities, many other deliverers would be able to use this material directly, but we have, we know that there are some universities in, um, who are developing new programs from scratch. Uh, we, we have partners we've talked to, and I'm thinking of one in particular in Kenya, starting a new education program in this area. So we think there's a role for GPST in, in to some extent, training the trainers. We need to think about how this is being delivered, the sorts of funding organisations we're going to, to to do the next stage of this, which is actually produce material. Are those that, that have a sort of a philanthropic outlook or a common good outlook? And so we would be aiming to make the material freely available. But what does freely mean? It's going to be a release under some form of the Creative Commons licences. And you see so many examples there. There's quite a hierarchy of those licences. So quite how much of that we do to share alike makes sense. Um, blocking derivatives, the no derivatives may not make sense, but where do we stand perhaps on, on non-commercial use uh, or sorry, commercial use? So feedback on that would be very welcome. Think of, of, of educationalists, but also recipients. Under what terms should we be making this material available? And we need to think about hosting platforms. We're not very far down this road, but but first, I should draw a distinction perhaps between a central repository of information and then servers that might actually stream it. And those could be different things. And there are several existing um, platforms that we might leverage or cooperate with. Um, and I've listed a few of them there. Next slide, please. Um, the lack of promise, I'll come back to this. And, and I think it chimes with some of the things that Julia said in her opening remarks. Um, we're fully committed to um, embedding consideration of diversity within our work, uh, particularly because we've got a global audience, but it would matter whatever our audience is. And that's because we're recognising the benefits that, first of all, diversity brings to solving problems, a richer um, solution set and inclusion of all the perspectives um, of, of all of the people of the world. Um, and we also need to recognise that this is an area in which, you know, 
we can't afford to waste talent. We need to ha harness and, and, and encourage all of the talent that exists. So that's why we care about uh, diversity. And we need to reflect that in what we do. In diversity in terms of the people who are engaged in, in designing and presenting material and in terms of um, the, the context setting. Mark talked about setting the context, that the material we will present that helps people in companies realize that they might want to engage with some of the up in company upskilling and also the material that would encourage people to engage with a new master's program and i think or we think it's very important there that people can see people like them in those context setting pieces of material um, i think I'm a, you know before i leave this slide i need to just say we did start with a small group of universities, so each have their own diversity you know, programs internally, but, but we could be open for some criticism starting with a small group. It made some sense because it enabled us to, to get a first cut of a, co of a comprehensive set of topics. Mm -hmm. but, but now that we are opening up to uh, the consultation phase, we would like to consult as widely as we possibly can and, and really bring in a, a lot more of that. Um, experience from around the world. Uh, should go to the next slide. Um, so we very much would like people to involve. I hope we've um, encouraged you through this, this relatively short presentation to, to engage with the material and to, to come back and with offers of help, the offers of additional input on things we've, we've omitted or not covered in enough detail or missed the point on, but also um, people who would like to help us develop the teaching and training materials. Also really interested in talking with people who would be the users of this material, um, involved in, uh, maybe as employers, thinking about who, it, what people in their organization would like, would, would like to, to see as training material, but also people who are thinking of developing, expanding, enhancing their, their postgraduate education programs. So if you want to do that, uh, there's a link there for how to get involved. And that's a supplement to the link that you have in the chat for how to read the initial teaching agenda. So I think that's about it from me. And I can hand over to Isabel, who's going to host the question and answer session. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to Julia, Belarco, Mark, Sadie, VJ, um, all of you guys for your great presentation. So um, as noted, please begin sending your questions into the Q&A. Um, I also want to note that um, I am dropping the link in to the um, Pillar 4 webinar that was mentioned um, at the top of the presentation. I just dropped a link to register for that webinar into the chat. Um, we'll also have a link to register for it on the website um, here in the next day or so. Um, and before we dive in, while you guys are sort of thinking up your questions, um, the deck and the presentation um, will both be made available. The, pre the This presentation and the recording will be on the um, GPST website shortly, um, and we will send out an email follow-up uh, that includes the deck and, and links to all these materials. So I saw that that was a question coming into chat in the Q&A, um, so I just wanted to cover that before we, we really dived in. Um, so we do have um, one question in. This is from um, Sanjini. She is one of our colleagues at NREL. Um, and Sanjini asked, and I think that this could go to Belarco, Mark, Tim, VJ. I think that you know probably any one of you guys could could be equipped to answer this one. Um, so many countries currently have targets for transitioning their vehicles to electric vehicles, to EVs creating a significant variable charging load, home or office, in the near future. Sanjini has two questions regarding the intersection of EV uptake and power. The first question is, do you all see themes that are at the nexus of EV slash power that need to be addressed in terms of workforce development specifically? Her second question is, should system operators learn about predicting loads by EV charging and how it couples to the rest of the ecosystem such as building. So um, whichever you got, one of you guys uh, wants to take that on, that, that's our first two-parter question from Sanjini. Uh, I can take a crack at the first, the second part. Um, I think Balarco, you can put your thinking hat on for the first part, I'd say. But so on the second part, I mean, I think I've mentioned it. We do need to 
you know, forecast. I, I said we need to do more forecasting and on, on a bigger platform. So yeah, we do need to be able to forecast EVs and what they do. And in fact, we do need to control them. So I think the answer is plain yes. Uh, as for the sec, the first part though, I think, I mean, I'll try answer it, but I think Balarka might want to say something about it. I mean, you're right. I mean, you know, transport, electricity are going to interact with each other and therefore there may be some specific teaching needs there. I'd have to say we, at the start of what we're doing here, are trying to concentrate on the power system side. Uh, so I don't deny that, you know, the world does need people who are knowledgeable about power systems and transport. Uh, and I'm sure some of the coursework that we would be proposing here will take account, you know, somewhat of transport, but not a huge, not a huge detail. It's really sort of power systems work and how the transport system impacts that. You're talking, I think, more around people who really understand both sides of, of the, you know, electricity system, which are valuable. So I think initially we're not going to go into that amount of detail. Balarco, does that sound? As you said, um, <clears throat> we have a, a, a subject area on interaction with other infrastructures, and within that we have a impact of EV charging. But it will we will be coming at that from more from a power system point of view rather than from the transportation aspect. So just quickly, Mark, uh, electric vehicles are interesting because we it might require us as power systems engineers to to understand load demand at much smaller geographic units, you know, heavy loading on particular feeders where EV charging is concentrating at particular times of day. And of course, EVs are widely sort of put forward as, as, as one of the most versatile forms of demand side response. So new ways of understanding how people use services and how services track to energy and particularly the transport use of energy I think it's going to be a key part of the of the education set of, of future power engineers. Great, thank you both, uh, or thanks all three of you guys. Um, so I also wanted to note if if you want to ask your question out loud, you can also use the raise hand function, um, and I can unmute you if you're more interested in um, saying your question rather than writing it out. So one of our other, this I guess this is more of kind of a, a statement, but um, we did have uh, in our Q&A, Michael Ahern from the IEEE Power and Energy Society. Um, Michael noted that IEEE Power and Energy Society is actively building our resource center and content. Um, and as the chair of the content acquisition and curation committee, um, he would love to learn how to work together with us. So. Um, he directed that to Tim, but, um, you know, I, I think that's great. He did drop his email in there as well, Tim, if you want to take a look. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, that was uh, Michael, wasn't it? Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. We, we will follow up on that. We have had uh, Edvina from uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute as, as part of the core team on the teaching agenda group, and she has kept us informed of some of that, but, but I'm very happy. Oh, oh very keen to um, to make contact with you directly and, and pick up on that. So, um, and it looks like, uh, Mark, you might have answered um, Balaraman's question about contingency analysis. So I will move on to Brian's question. This is directed at Tim and Mark. Does GPST have an initiative to bring in more universities or a specific plan? I think, Tim, you touched on this a little bit, but if you guys want to elaborate uh, any further. So, to, well, well, I answer in general, Tim, and you answer it specifically on the teacher yeah. side. Does that make sense? So, in a general sense, for the whole of GPST, I'll speak is that we did, we, you know, we have made it clear to people that there's a, do you want to get involved part of the website? And we've asked people to respond to that. So, you know, we're open to anyone saying yes, they want to be involved. And we've responded to all those people, as far as I know. You know, we several hundred people say they want to be involved, and we've, we've, they're on mail lists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in the generic sense, the answer is yes. I'd have to admit though, that our scaling up is going so fast that, you know, we're, we're just not able to keep up with some things that are happening. On the, on the, on the research side though, on pillar one, and, and Tim, I think can speak about pillar two. On the research side, we are just about to set up a research advisory committee. It's, it's not just system operators, it's universities, 
manufacturers. It's it's a it's a broader group of people, and we're literally going to set it up very shortly. So if you want to participate in this, go to the website and express your interest in various pillars, and you will then hear from us in some way. In terms of the teaching, though, I'll pass it over to, to Tim because there is a specific plan for that, as far as I know. Yeah, I think there's a few layers to the answer to that. So, so first of all, yes, but broadly speaking, the answer is yes. We welcome um, engagement from from anybody who thinks they can can help or benefit to both sides of that. Um, the the six universities we've been working so far, it, it's it's a small number of people, and we're doing this uh, kind of on a voluntary basis. This is not a a funded activity as yet um, to scope out what should be a large and funded activity at some point. Um, and, I don't, and, and I know we don't think we can deliver all of it. So if people have resources, they've put time and effort into creating resources that, that they already make open and they would like us to, to include, that, that, that's great. We'd love to hear about that. If there are people who've you know, always wanted to develop a new course on subject X and they see it listed here and, and want to volunteer, I think we're very interested in that. If you'd like to just provide feedback on the the nine subject areas and the hundred and something individual topics and and the fleshing out of some of the uh, topic descriptors, if, if you if you'd like to get engaged with that, that's fine. Um, we have th through the good the very good work of Sadie and colleagues at Pillar Two, got some uh, universities that we're reaching out to now in Indonesia, Colombia. Uh, Kenya and, 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 and South Africa and a range of countries, uh, I should mention Vietnam as well, um, to, to try to make sure that what we're developing, which is frankly from something of a developed world context, is ringing true for, for universities in those, and, and system operators in those regions. So um, anybody, uh, anybody from around the globe who thinks they have a, something useful to contribute here is welcome to. to Click the link, make make themselves known, and and we'll do what we can to welcome you in. Great, thank you, Mark and Tim. So, um, this question is about Andrew Larkins, and it sort of um, talks about the topic areas of of the teaching agenda. Have you considered a training program that introduces electricity grids inverter based resources first, so without teaching about uh, synchronous generators before IBR. Tim. I, I oh, what a lovely thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, personally, that that appeals to me. Um, you know, start from a different place. Where you know, where would you get to if you started from inverter-based resources? What would our grid and the whole system look like? Is there a bit in the research agenda? You know, to, at what point do you stop trying to make? In, inverter-based resources live in a synchronous machine world and make the last few synchronous machines live in an inverter-based world. Um, I, I think in the teaching agenda, our, our focus is forward-looking, but probably, you know, in the decade or 15-year horizon. What are the technologies where people will need very, very shortly to, to have this new education? Um, as ever, you know, we all think, we all hope as educators that what we're doing is, is, is doing best principles and from there people can expand. But of course, you know, sometimes fresh basic principles come up. So that wasn't quite answering your question. I like the idea personally. It's a bit of a leap from where we sit at the moment as, as educators. I'll take it away and think about it. But, and if you want to get in touch with me directly and discuss it, I'm very, very happy to do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll right. just add to that. I, I, I think if you did that, the problem would be that the real power system is synchronous still and, you know, largely speaking. So it would really be doing a disservice to students in many respects because, you know, the, the system is changing right now, it's still largely synchronous. So it's a nice idea, yeah. but I think it would fly in terms of the, the, the educational needs of people right now. All right, thank you, Mark and Tim. So we have one, this is kind of a, um, or let's see, here we go. Um, yeah, have you considered the demand side response will become a core part of grid operations? It will be critical to grid operations. Well, 
but does Balarka want to answer that? Or? Yeah, Mark, you can take that. I think we have um, more than one topic under operation subject area, yeah. which covers demand side response. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, so to, yeah, to answer the question, yeah, I mean, it is one of many things that's changing. So, like I said at the start, there's demand side, you know, IBRs, inverter based resources, interaction with our system. So, it's one of many things that's changing. Um, it is in there. I think it's in there in its own right, but it's also in there across all parts. So it's just it's just another part. It's another part of many of the subsystems. Another part of the whole system. I mean, how important it will be in the future? You know, it's, you know I think you've said a comment here that I think the comment says will be critical to grid operations. I mean. In some places it might be, and in some places it may not be. I mean, not, not every system is different. I think that's one thing we have to really stress is that, you know, in GPST in general, we, we, we've discovered very early on that while there's commonality among all the systems, there's also differences. So if you take Quebec as a, an example, Quebec is essentially a 99% type of system to start with. And, you know, it's completely different than the, the Irish system, for example, which is largely speaking wind and, and gas. So. I think the same is going to be important. It's probably regionally based, but who knows what will happen with the demand side? So, but it is included. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, so, uh, just a reminder: feel free to send in any questions. Um, we do have a, still a little bit of time to address any of them. Um, so, th this is just a comment um, from. Uh, Faith Cornell that um, the State Department's power sector program is working with Vietnam's NLDC with uh, with several partners and would welcome the opportunity to separately coordinate. Um, I don't know if that necessarily uh, needs a response, but um, it, it was a, a comment from Faith there. Um, this is Sadie. Um, I'll just I'll just say that I'll definitely follow up with with Faith on um, yeah talking about collaboration because we'd love to discuss further. We're also working with them. Thank you. Thank you, Sadie. So, uh, you know, in, in case anyone is thinking of uh, additional questions, um, Mark, I know you answered this via chat, but in, in case anyone um, isn't able to see your response there, um, we can maybe address the question from uh, Balaraman, which is how different is contingency analysis yeah. with conventional system compared to high level VRE? Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I, yeah, was, was my response to him just private, was it? Uh, yeah, yes, it, it, I, I'm not sure if it was private. I could no, see it, it, but just... it, it. Yeah, it doesn't make any difference. No, I mean, I, I'd have to admit that when I did look through the slides, uh, that topic didn't. I mean, we put the slides together recently and, and it ended up in there. I left it in there. I mean, it's probably not a dramatic change, but there are some changes. I mean, for example, I know that in, in, in some studies we did in Ireland that, that actually the, the distance that wind turbines are from the load, you know, that they're they're far away does lead to the the possibility of additional contingencies that wouldn't have normally happened. So in most cases, you know, again, I'll just use a specific example of Ireland. Most of the synchronous generation is near the load electrically, but if you have a lot of the generation a long way from the load, you can get contingencies that wouldn't be normal. The other one then, of course, is you know the whole issue that you know solar and wind have huge commonality. Oh, sorry, you know, solar resources are highly correlated with each other. This leads to a situation where some of these so-called contingencies are highly correlated with each other. And that's another aspect of this as well. So I wouldn't think it's a huge changes, but there's certainly some additional ones as well. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, Balarama was happy with that answer, I think. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um... All right. I, I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. Um, so I, I did see one come in privately from uh, Jorge Martinez um, about the cost of these courses or, or resources. Um, this was touched on during Tim's. I, I think I could probably just answer this, but this was touched on during Tim's um, presentation that these courses and resources should all be accessed more or less free. Um, Tim talked a little bit about the, the exact delivery they're still sort of working on, but um, it'll be under some sort of, you know, 
common <laughs> licensing or, or free licensing. So, um, Jorge, no worries about the cost. Um, we're definitely doing our best to pretty much make everything uh, available to everyone. Um, and let's see if we have any other questions. I, I guess um, no, if you just add to that, Isabel. I mean, it, it, sure. it, it, everything we've done so far is openly available. You know, the teaching agenda. That's because it's been done by a set of volunteers. Um, we can't do the whole thing through volunteer effort. We're, we're hoping to fundraise, particularly for organizations with a, with a mission to promote decarbonization and, um, and wider energy access in, in low and middle income countries. And those sorts of organizations and, and philanthropic donors and so forth are likely to want us to pursue you know, freely available materials. So that is our mission. Even when we are funded to develop, we meaning the broad we, not just the first six universities, but everyone engaged. When we're funded to develop material, it will be for free delivery to the, to the end user at least. There's a little bit of thinking to do about whether we put a no commercial use term on that, uh, but that's for another day. Certainly. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm going to say last call for questions. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and, you know, smash that enter button so we can see it. Um, Otherwise, we may be able to give everyone five minutes of their morning, evening, or afternoon back. So, um, don't see anything coming in. Um, I guess with that, I'll, I'll open up it up to the presenters. I don't know if there's anything else that you guys want to add. Um, I think on my end, I, I'll just say, um, like I said, this will all be sent out. Um, it'll be added to the website and we'll send out follow up to everyone who's joined today, as well as anyone who registered. Um, please visit our get involved page if you, uh, as many of you probably already have, but um, please visit it and be sure to mark what pillar you're interested in. That question is very important because that is how we are able to sort of segment you guys and, um, you know, make sure that we're, we're, you know, sharing your information with the right set of leads so they can contact you for collaboration. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know if, if anyone else has any final comments, but um, I think we're, we're all wrapped up with questions. All right, great. <laughs> okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us um, from wherever you are and then whatever time zone <laughs> you're in. We appreciate everyone's participation. Um, please do be on the lookout for our follow-up email and feel free to share these resources um, or, or spread, uh, you know, understanding about the global PST um, through, through your network and through anyone you think may be interested. So um, we appreciate you all's time and um, have a great day, everyone. And, and thanks to our presenters. Thank you, Belarco, Julia, Sadie, VJ, Mark, and Tim. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thanks. everyone.